Hello, my name is Ray Hughes, and I'm an interviewer for the Veterans History Project conducted by the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. And today's date is the 14th of March, 2018, and this interview is being conducted at the Cincinnati Hamilton County Public Library in Cincinnati, Ohio. And it's locally monitored and administered by Brian Powers, who is our cameraman today. And today we have the honor and privilege of interviewing a United States Navy veteran, James Rudolph Bodmer. And uh, Mr. Bodmer, it's a pleasure to meet you. And is it all right just to call you Jim? Very well. Okay. Well, Jim, if you would, we'll get some biographical information first. If you tell us your date of birth and where you were born. I was born in East Cleveland, Ohio, uh, June 3rd, 1938. I see. Along yeah. with my brother. A twin? I'm an identical, mirror image identical twin. A what? A mirror image identical twin, the way the egg split. Ah. I ended up left-handed and he ended up right-handed and that's the way it happens. I see, and what was his name? And what is his name? His name is John. John. Now, is your brother, uh, your twin brother, still living? He lives up in Kirtland, Ohio. I East see. of Cleveland. I see. Um, and your parents' name, your mom and dad? My dad's name was Rudolph Carl, and my mother's name was Louise Genevieve. And, and uh, her maiden name? Her maiden name was Lutz, or Lutz, say she pronounced it. L U T Z. L U T Z. She's from Ann Arbor, Michigan. My dad is from Pittsburgh area, and uh, they met when he was a student at University of Michigan. I see. They both were students there. No, he, she was not. She's seven years younger. She ended up uh, at Michigan State Normal College, which is now Eastern Michigan, but, uh, but she was, she was uh, probably, I don't know how they met exactly, but uh, she was in high school or something. He was, he was uh, worked for a while before he went to college, and uh, he got an engineering degree from Michigan. But uh, so he was a lot. Of, she was older. She wasn't. She was seven years younger than him. But he wasn't 22, and she wasn't 15. We'll put it that way. Okay. Uh, what did your dad do for a living? He was a mechanical engineer for a company called the Bailey Meter Company in Cleveland. Uh, they made controls for uh, power plants, uh, some uh, instruments that were used on Navy ships, I know, and, uh, but mainly uh, controls for power plants. Did your mother work? No, she did not work. How many brothers and sisters did you I have? I have one brother, just, just a twin. twin brother. I see. Uh, did you know your grandparents, uh, Jim? I knew my grandfathers real well. Uh, my one grandmother died. I had a step-grandmother, knew her on my mother's side. But uh, my grandfather... Uh, what about your grandfather on the Bodmer side? Uh, he was a, I believe, a tinsmith. He worked in, uh, out of Houston, Pennsylvania, which is near Cannonsburg, south of Pittsburgh. and. Uh, he lived to be 83, he died in 1953, I remember him well. And uh, his wife died when I was about three months older, so, so I didn't have a grandmother on that side. And uh, your grandfather on your my grand side? My grandfather on my mother's side uh, uh, is from Ann Arbor, and, and his father, and I knew, had knew my great-grandfather there too, they both worked at the University of Michigan. My great-grandfather worked, was a maintenance man. I think he was one of the original maintenance men at the University of Michigan, I'm what told. What were their names? Uh, George John and John George. And, uh, and, and it's hard to say which because my grandfather's name was John George, but they called him George too, so. Uh, but he was worked in the medical school at the University of Michigan for 50 oh, so years. So you go way back there to the University of Michigan. Right. Gosh. Um, what did, did uh, church did you folks belong to there in Cleveland? In Cleveland, I First Presbyterian Church of East Cleveland, born and raised there, was there till I, till I moved out of Cleveland, I guess. I, I just out of curiosity, you remember your address where you lived at in Cleveland? 2109 Alton Road. 
uh, which is up on a hill across from Neela Park, which is the General Electric Lighting Institute, which is fairly famous, at least in that area, anyhow. Mm -hmm. And you said that you were born in a hospital on... Um I was born in a hospital here in Road Hospital, which just happened to be on John D. Rockefeller's estate. It's called Forest Hills Park now, and I don't think the hospital's there anymore, but... Oh, okay. uh, yeah. Um, what schools did you go to? Well, grade school was Prospect School. There were six grade schools in East Cleveland, one junior high school called Kirk Junior High School, which has been torn down and they call it Heritage now. And then Shaw High School was the, the high school I went to. I see. Um, did you, uh, were you involved in sports while you were in high school? Not. Not really varsity sports. I, I tried to play football till I got hurt. I tried to play basketball a little bit, and and, uh, and so I played mostly intramural sports: volleyball, football, basketball. Uh, I grew up. I played uh, baseball, fast pitch softball, and uh, then slow pitch when I came here. What about your twin brother? Did he about the same as I am? Okay. Uh, it's it's amazing that. Uh, I think our, our personalities are quite alike. Uh, our sense of humor, I've told her, are, are exactly alike, and you know that, but, or you know mine. But uh, 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 I think our, we, we grew up together and, and uh, pretty much the same. Our grades in school were virtually the same, anyhow, the tests and so on that we took, so. For the uh, viewers, uh, Jim and I happen to be personal friends. And uh, that's why we're so familiar with each other. Um, so we were, uh, you graduated from high school at uh, what year? Did 1956, you? went to Miami University, joined the ROTC program there, and uh, that's where I got commissioned. Why did you go to Miami when your parents were from the well, University of Michigan? That's a long story. Well, not a long story. I can't tell you exactly why. I remember those days, uh, the, uh, we didn't, you didn't visit schools. There were no expressways, and, and it was like eight or ten hours to, from Cleveland to Oxford. But the schools used to come to the, the your colleges used to come to the high school and bring a, a movie, a film mm -hmm. on the campus and so on. I'd been accepted at the University of Michigan and was planning on going there. And uh, when they came, people from Miami came, I just went home that day and told my parents that's where I wanted to go to school. Why? Maybe because it was small, maybe because it was the fact that the main street didn't run straight through town. It stopped and turned and went a block out of the way, so you had to stop there, I guess. But uh, uh, Miami was 5,000 students back then and it was a little school and my father was all for it because he wouldn't have had to pay out-of-state tuition. Mm -hmm. so. Um, so you started there, what, in September of 1956? August or sept September 1956. Graduated in June 60. I see. And uh, did, were you, in, uh, you, you enrolled in the uh, Naval ROTC program, but after you had been there? Just, well, weeks after. Oh, okay. You know, right at the, at the time of entrance. Okay. Uh, and um, what were you majoring in in college? I was a, a marketing major and uh, started off in accounting and changed to marketing. And it's uh, kind of ironic because I've never used my marketing degree after I got out of, out of off active duty in the Navy. I went to work for Kroger and I was a store manager and then went into accounting and was in accounting there for uh, eight years, I guess, and then left and went to work for Hillshire Farm and Cons as an accountant mm -hmm. and ended up as a plant controller. Mm -hmm. We'll get to that in a little bit. Uh, while you were at college, you know, have you met your uh, to be future wife yet, or no? Uh, it was actually a blind date my junior year at college. At college, okay. she's my. And uh, who who introduced you then? If it was a blind date, gee, I don't remember. If it was through a fraternity brother, I guess, or 
or well, so. Well, you should remember that, Jim. No, I don't remember that. It was. And what? Uh, and what is your wife's name? Mary. And middle name or? Uh, well, her middle name she doesn't use Jane, but uh, uh. her maiden name's Muma, M O O M A W. But uh, Muma. Yep. I see. Um, so you met her in your junior year of college. That's correct. Uh, did you all get engaged or married while you're still in college? Oh no, we weren't allowed to in the Navy. So uh, we got engaged after I graduated in, in 60 and then we got married in March 61. Now, uh, what was your wife's major in college? Education. Did your wife work after college? She worked uh, one year in Cincinnati and then after we got married she came out to California and uh, and then, of course, we were there for a year or two and then uh, came back to Cincinnati. She substituted a little bit, but not really a full-time Never job. went full-time again. Right. Uh, and what about children, Jim? I have two children. One, Debbie. Uh, Deborah Lynn's her name. She was born in 65. And Catherine, Kathy, in 67. And what about uh, grandchildren? I have two, they each have a boy and a girl. Uh, Debbie has uh, a daughter named Sarah, who is, I think, uh, 23 or so, 24 maybe now, and a boy, uh, and I just forgot his name, Sammy, who uh, was born in 97, so he'd be 21 now. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, they, Sarah graduated from George Mason University. Sammy goes to George Mason University down in Virginia. That's where they live. And then I have, uh, t Kathy has two kids. Uh, Colleen, who is a, a junior, or a sophomore at Miami now. And then uh, Brendan, who's a sophomore in high school, at Milford High School. How long did you go with uh, Mary before you, you folks got married, would you say? Well, I met her in February 59, got married in March 61. Now, did you know you guys were uh, going to hit it off right away, on you, would you say? I suppose. I, you know, I can't really say. Well, I started dating her and that was it. Mm -hmm. So I didn't date anybody else, so. Okay. Well, that's, that sounds good. Uh, so now let's go and we'll start on your military career. So you graduated from college and when? Graduated from college in June uh, 1960, got commissioned at, at graduation and uh, went to uh, uh, communication school in San Diego. What's that involved? Uh, just a couple weeks of learning cryptography and, and uh, how to do the cryptography, how the machines work and so on. And uh, then I, I guess I don't remember how I got from San, uh, San Diego up to San Francisco, but uh, uh, ended up, flew over to Westpac and it's a long story, but I ended up reporting to the USS Oriskany landed on board and uh, uh, what were you find when you landed on board? It was the COD, it was an S2F uh, twin engine same planes they used uh, similar to the planes they used for anti-submarine warfare but uh, it wasn't a jet plane and uh, too prop, uh, too prop. Too, uh, What base is that San Francisco that you went to? Well they, I had signed up initially for uh, to be on a destroyer was my choice out of Treasure Island, not knowing that there were never no destroyers based at Treasure Island. And so they gave me the a carrier division staff out of Alameda. So we were out of Alameda, California, which is, Naval Air Station. Which is an island off of... Uh, off of Oakland. Uh, yeah, right. And, That's correct. Yeah. And how long were you there? At Oak, Alameda, we were there very seldom because we were at sea all the time. I see. Uh, so, from, so from there, where did it? I, well, when I when I left San Diego, I immediately went up to Travis Air Force Base, got on an airplane, prop plane, not a jet, 
uh, flew to uh, Japan by way of uh, Honolulu, Wake Island, and to Japan. And then uh, uh, I was at uh, Yokosuka for about five or six days and got a phone call saying, be ready, go up to Atsugi, We're go you're going out to the Oriskany. And it was a funny situation because I was in a hurry to get repacked, get up to Atsugi Naval Air Station. And when I got up there, there was a Navy captain and I were ready to fly out and the plane only had room for one and he wanted to go, so I didn't. And the next day I stayed up there that night and the next day I flew out and landed on the Oriskany at five o'clock in the evening. And uh, the next morning we were back in Yokosuka where we, we were supposed to be. So it was a fun jaunt for a when you when, uh, when you flew out of, um, did you fly out of Travis and go to uh, Honolulu on Wake or? Yes. Yeah. Um, you spend any time at all in Honolulu? Two hours. Two hours. Called a fraternity brother and he wasn't home. He was in Minnesota. Yeah. Now when you went to Wake Island, you know I was on Wake Island also. We talked about this before. Did you get to spend any time on Wake? No, just a few hours. Yeah. Just uh, saw the ship that sunk you out You saw there the freighter at, uh, in right. the lagoon. I forget the name of it. Something yeah. Maru. But, uh, yeah, Maru, yeah. Uh, and there, there used to be a, like a little... Um, lounge there a bar right at, we didn't get you didn't get in didn't, the didn't get to there yeah okay uh, did you get to explore any other part of the island other no than, no we we uh were in a hurry i guess what, what kind of plane did you fly on it was a mats uh military, military air transfer. Air transfer. probably a dc-6 i'm guessing mm -hmm. so from wake you flew uh, directly on into wake into uh, uh Tachikawa Air Force Base in Japan. Okay. So, and, uh, so when you got there, you flew out to the Oriskany. 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 Um, and that, is that to be your ship? Yes. That's, uh, well, the staff, we were on that ship at the time. So I was on the Carrier Division 7 staff as Assistant Communications Officer. And uh, uh, we landed there. And... Uh, and it was a it was an exciting flight because it was just what you picture the the plane uh, the ship being a size of a postage stamp, and and the the is about 700 feet long, which is shorter. It's a World War II ship. It was built right at the end of World War II. It was in Korea, and uh, in Vietnam. But uh, uh, the uh, ship is about the size of a postage stamp and you see and they were having air operations and so we were circling around for about an hour before we left or landed and uh, uh, it was like a bunch of flies landing on a, a piece of paper or something. What did you and, feel like that? Oh it was, it was exciting. Huh? I, I was excited. I, I always wanted to be a Navy pilot and they wouldn't let me in because I had astigmatism and uh, you know I might have killed myself somewhere along the line doing it but uh, but they went, so it was exciting landing. I landed later on the Ranger, but uh, uh, after I got married, but. Well, why did you just stay there overnight when you landed on the? Uh, well, it was over, uh, we were, we were uh, it was misunderstanding. We, le we stayed on the ship overnight, then they pulled into Yokosuka, which was where they were oh, originally scheduled right. to be. And then we were on, for the cruise, we were on the Oriskany the whole time. Oh, okay. and what was the nomenclature for CV? CV, it was CVA then. They, they had, they're C all CVs. Of CVA okay. stands for attack carrier, yeah. 34. CVA 34. So then after, after you come back to Asugi. From, well, we flew, you, went to Atsugi to fly out onto the Oriskany, and then we stayed on the Oriskany for the whole cruise, uh, spent time in the South China Sea, off Vietnam, uh, uh, all three carriers I was on, we did that. But uh, went to uh, Hiroshima, Nagasaki. I maybe not all on the Oriskany, but uh, anyhow, after that cruise, it was an eight-month cruise. We we came back to uh, San Diego, and then uh, we flew from San Diego up to Alameda, and we were there a very short period of time. 
Uh, what is, uh, tell us about, you were on, at sea for a total of eight months on there? Well, the, the cruises are eight month cruises. Uh, I wasn't quite on for eight months, probably six on the Oriskany. And then... Uh, what, what's life like aboard a, a World War II? Like living in a dorm. Uh, you know, you, you, could go, you could go two weeks a lot of times maybe we did without going up to see daylight because, you know, the, the aircraft carrier is a, just like a city. I mean, it's got your staterooms or quarters. It's got a uh, uh, little ship store where you can buy uh, shaving cream and all that kind of stuff. And, and of course, they got the mess where you eat. And uh, what were your duties aboard the uh, CBA 34? Assistant communications, uh, uh, crypto watches, crypto cryptography in, in communications in the comm center. Did you have Encrypting any? Encrypting and decrypting uh, messages and so on. Did you get pretty good at that? Well, yeah, I went to school and it wasn't that difficult. So. You had to have, a, what, a top secret clearance for that? Yep. Crypto. What type of messages did you de de decide? Well, gee, it's been so long now, I can't, but just everything. Uh, obviously, most messages were standard messages, uh, might deal with anything. Uh, the, uh, uh, did you inter intercept any foreign messages or anything? No, 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 no. We weren't, uh, we weren't part of the security group that tried to de uh, okay. Crypto, whereas it was just we were sending out our messages to to ships and different places that we were mm -hmm. encrypting. Uh, I never got involved with the real top secret stuff. What about the type of aircraft that were on the uh, CVA thirty four? Well, we uh, mostly jet aircraft. The best, the nicest one was the F eight Crusader, F eight U Crusader which is uh, the first Navy plane that would break the sound barrier. They had an F-3 Demon, which was a huge thing that wasn't sleek looking. Uh, the other, and they had an A-3D, which uh, is like a B-66 mm -hmm. in the Air Force. And uh, it's a big plane that fit on the aircraft, on the Oriskany. It would come in within uh, six feet of, the wingspan came within six feet of the edge of the deck and we landed them at night. Now they never landed them at night in the Atlantic as far as I know, but uh, that's why I was probably just as well that I wasn't a pilot, but because uh, it's a controlled crash when you land yeah. and uh, so on. And then we had the old AD Sky Raider, which is uh, they called a SPAD, but uh, the single engine prop plane that uh, carried more weight in bombs and so on than the plane weighed. Wow. But, and a couple others too, but uh, well, most of those are the main ones. You know, when you think about it, it's a profound education that you got there being on the, one of the last of the World War II type aircraft carriers. Well, we went from there to, and I can't remember which order, we went to the Ranger. Well, that's, no, that, no, the Ranger was the last one. When you went back to, uh, oh, yeah. We went on a second cruise. The Ranger was the CB4, if I remember correctly. Well, the original Ranger. Yeah. Uh, we went, actually, we went from, uh, when, after we came back to the United States, we stayed in, in Alameda for a short period, and then that's when I went and got married. And uh, Where'd you get married at? In Cincinnati. Oh, you came home on leave? Yep. How long of a leave did you have? Two weeks. And where'd you uh, and Mary get married at? Cincinnati. What church? Uh, Kennedy Heights Presbyterian Church. I see. And uh, did you guys yeah. go on a honeymoon? We, well, we just drove down into Virginia and, uh, and back. And because I didn't have a car, uh, I never owned a car till after I got married. Good. Weren't allowed to have one in college. Couldn't afford one when I was in high school and didn't need one when I was on active duty. Well, whose car did you use when you went on the well, My brothers. Your brothers? And my brothers. Yeah. And uh, then when we flew back, I flew back. We, I spent a week before we got married, and then we spent a week, and then I left. And, uh, and Mary stayed home? And she went. stayed here to finish the year teaching. And uh, then, because we were at sea all the time anyhow. We, uh, even when we were in Alameda, we'd go out for 
a two-week period and then come in for a weekend and then go out for another two-week period on, on a different ship and uh, then uh, a different carrier and then uh, uh, when I flew back that was the next ex interesting thing because uh, we went uh, there was bad weather in Indianapolis and when I got to Chicago I missed the plane that was supposed to go to San Francisco so we stayed there for about eight hours or nine and and uh, United Airlines gave me a book of tickets to go anywhere I wanted to as long as I'd get closer to my destination and they weren't any good because there were no planes going out of Chicago anyhow so they finally got a plane to go to Omaha and then from Omaha we went to Denver and from Denver we went to Los Angeles and this was all during the night then and uh, when we flew from Los Angeles up to uh, San Francisco we were going over the Oakland Bay Bridge when the Ranger which is CVA 61 it's the super carrier was going under it so <clears throat> fortunately I had a, a BOQ room they had two rooms with an adjoining bath and and the, the fellow on the other side was part of the transportation squadron so I just called him up and and I flew out to land it on the Ranger the next day or that day and uh, that was not like landing on the you Arisky. landed on the Ranger what, what, what kind of plane were you on? same type of plane uh, the cod uh, and uh, uh, but it was the Rangers a lot bigger it's about 1100 and some feet long and so I was well over the end of the deck before we landed I saw the deck before we landed on that one on the risk and you just saw water 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 bang you're down but uh, uh, so that were my two carrier landings that I made and which, uh, tell us about the Ranger it's just big you know it's three football fields long and has a crew I'm not sure how many we, we had uh, could have a crew of about 4,000 I think something like that and it was a little bit better it was some of the spaces were air conditioned uh, in the meantime in the in the middle there we were on the Ticonderoga which is CVA 14 which is a World War II it was hit by kamikazes and so on but uh, at any rate uh, they weren't weren't air conditioned and our staterooms were right underneath the flight deck and we were triple bunked and except you couldn't sleep in the top one because there's a big air duct right on about this high above off the bunk but uh, uh, and it was hot because we're underneath a steel deck with the sun beating down on this it. This is on the Ranger? Uh, no, on the Ariskany and the, and the Ticonderoga. Oh, okay. The Ranger was air conditioned, but the Ranger was, uh, when they put air conditioning in, you couldn't control it. So you, it was cold all the time. And you had to wrap uh, towels around the air conditioning ducts to keep, the, keep it warm. But uh, it was, we weren't in the same place. Usually uh, when on the Ranger, seems like the staterooms are all on the O3 level with the main deck is deck one you go down to the engineering spaces that's deck seven or something down going down one two three four five six seven going up the first deck between the the flight deck the the hangar deck is is uh, the main deck on a carrier then there are three decks O1 O2 or zero one zero two zero three up to the flight deck and or the for the flight deck maybe and, and our, our staterooms were on the third deck 03 level right under the flight deck and usually it was right aft of where the catapults were or right in front of where the landing gear is so every time a plane landed or took off you were awake mm -hmm. it was pretty noisy and uh, it's, you just learn to live with it uh, when uh, when we were down a year ago or so down to the LST and down it was down on the river you know that brought brought back a lot of memories because you smell the fuel oil and the kerosene and all that stuff that uh, of being on a ship did you um, have any stop at any different port, ports of call or so yeah, we spent a, quite a bit of time in uh, in the Philippines uh, at uh, Olongapo Subic Bay was the naval station, QB Point Naval Air Station, they're joining. 
and uh, Manila. Uh, we went to in, in J to Japan and Sasebo, which is in southern Japan, and uh, from there we went to visit uh, uh, Nagasaki and Hiroshima, and we were in in Okinawa and uh, Hong Kong. Spent a total of about a month in Hong Kong over a period of the two years on active duty, which was exciting. That was interesting. Did, did you get to go uh, into the towns of Nagasaki or Hiroshima? Yes, yes, uh, to the museums and everything else. Were there still uh, any uh, effects still at, visible? At, uh, yes, at, at, I'm trying to think which one it was. One of the towns, one of them we went into, uh, you know, here this is 1960 or 61, which is 15 years afterward. And we saw some people that had burns on their arms and so on. Uh, pretty much uh, Nagasaki was, uh, it was just kind of like a, a, it's down in the, uh, in the open space in the ground and, and uh, it was like a park, uh, very quiet and so on. Hiroshima was different in that uh, it was completely different. The museum was cold, dark, uh, you really felt different when you went there. Uh, it, uh, and it's right outside the one building that was standing after the, uh, the bomb blast. But, uh, and, and uh, you know, of course, it was had all the, the uh, different artifacts there that were there after the bomb that they had in the, mm -hmm. in the museum. It was very interesting, very sobering, at, uh, especially at Hiroshima. While you were on board that ship, um, or on board the aircraft carrier, rather, uh, did you serve with anybody that was actually in World War II? Because there was still a lot of them around. Oh, yes. Uh, with the admirals that I served under were all, there were three of them, uh, all World War II admirals. I didn't know the last one as well as the first two. But uh, it was interesting being on a, an admiral's staff uh, sometimes we would go in and we'd have uh, uh, dignitaries come on board. And I don't remember exactly what we talked about, but uh, I spent about an hour and a half or two hours on the flag bridge talking to a, a Japanese fellow who was the commander of a Japanese destroyer in World War II. And uh, uh, like I say, I don't remember what we talked about except that, you know, he felt that he was serving his country and, uh, you know, it was uh, just like the people in the United States were serving our country to fight for our country. And he was fighting for his country. Mm -hmm. But we, you know, like I said, we were, it made several port, port calls like that. We'd take uh, dignitaries for a half a day cruise or something mm -hmm. like that. And uh, we, we did go into the South China Sea and we served, they were fighting in Laos at the time. And we had, and being an ensign, I didn't have very much to do with it, but we were, had some kind of a connection with the MAG group, which was the Military Assistance uh, something group. MAC, M-A-C, or it was Military Assistance Command. Yeah, at the MACB Vietnam. Well, it was for, yeah for Vietnam. It was before Vietnam started, mm -hmm. and uh, I don't know how that worked out because the Vietnam Service Ribbon supposedly wasn't started until '64, '65, mm -hmm. but uh, somehow they sent me one, mm -hmm. and I think it was they made some different. Uh, Criteria for criteria for it, yeah. yeah. But uh, we were off the coast. I don't. I never really considered myself a Vietnam veteran because nobody shot at me. We could see the shoreline in the, about 20 miles away, the mountains. But uh, uh, and we never lost. No, well, we lost pilots, but we didn't. I don't think we had any that were shot down because they were flying more reconnaissance and so on over uh, South Vietnam. And I don't think we went into Laos. As I said, the fighting was all in Laos then. We had a couple incidents uh, while I was there when we were on the 
Ticonderoga, which was kind of in between the Ranger and the Oriskany. Uh, we were on a probably six out of eight months cruise on the Oriskany, and then we were probably, and I don't remember, we switched. It had to be, it had to be, we, well, I'm trying to figure out, I never can remember how, when we were, time period we were on the uh, uh, Ticonderoga. But when we were on the Ticonderoga, we had a, a destroyer have a fire in their main distribution switchboard, and they ran into the Ticonderoga. I can never remember the name of it. I'd like to think about it, what it is, but uh, left the starboard anchor of the destroyer embedded into the side of the carrier. And I got pictures, slides at home of it. Of the Did you take on water or anything? No, 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 we didn't. And luckily, it bent the bow of the destroyer, but it didn't cause a break. And, uh, and then they had to go into the shipyards in the Philippines and get that fixed. And uh, we were there. Uh, other time, the two, two other exciting times, one was on the Oriskany. And that was when we were in college, there was somebody on the Johnny Carson show that was supposedly a predicted the future. Now, no Essex class carrier has ever been sunk. And the Oriskany is an Essex class carrier. And he made a statement that on October, whatever, 13th or 23rd or whatever, 1960, the Oriskany was going to sink. And when I got my uh, orders to uh, the staff, which was, I knew it was going to be on the Oriskany, everybody said, oh, let us know what happens when you sink. Well, that particular day, we did sit dead in the water between two typhoons for part of the day. So it was something that <laughs> didn't sink, but, yeah. and then... Uh, you pondered it. it yeah, it? just a little bit. But, uh, but it was, again, it wasn't anything we were worried about. It was just kind of an exciting thing to say, hey, this guy predicted something and, and we're here. But uh, then on the, uh, I think it might have been the Oriskany also, the day that uh, Khrushchev banged his shoe on the table of the United Nations and said, tomorrow I'm going to make an announcement that's going to change the history of the world. And he never did. But uh, we were in the South China Sea that night and saw the biggest shooting star you could ever imagine. And it's never been confirmed, but we are sure that they tried to put a man in space and failed. Because that's what, what it seemed like after the fact that we figured mm -hmm. out what it might have been. But it's, those are the, the biggest, uh, you know, like I say, we were never in, in combat anything, so. You said in a passing remark here that, uh, that you lost a few pilots. What do you mean by that? A few pilots? Well, I would guess that even once a month, you'd have a pilot fly into a mountain or something go wrong with the plane and they'd have to ditch. Uh, there was a couple not, not very pleasant sites where pilot crashed coming into the land on the carrier and the uh, plane went in the water and uh, when a jet plane hits the water, it disintegrates immediately, so. Uh, and you, you lost those, those men? Uh, probably about one a month. And we're not able to recover them. Right. Uh, yeah, we don't think about that as an everyday occurrence, but it mm -hmm. certainly is in our military even today. We had one, one uh, the, the, it was, uh, I forget what the designation is, but it's the uh, plane with the radome on top. It was like the S2F that I flew into that size, but it had a radome on top. And when we were on the uh, Ticonderoga, it came in and landed, instead of landing straight onto the angled deck. And you got to remember that when the ship's going forward, that angled deck that you land on is going really sliding sideways. So when the pilot comes in, he's got to, got to not only go straight, but but to the side, and uh, it went over the side and was hanging by its tail hook from the uh, from the uh, uh, resting gear, and uh, everybody jumped out and they picked them up, and then the biggest problem was they had to to sink the plane 
because the radar was like a balloon on top of the plane and holding it up. So one of the destroyers, we always had a, at least had a destroyer with us as what they called plane guard. And that was the guy that was supposed to pick up the guy if the guy was down. And uh, they went out and shot their five inch shells at the plane and of course the I don't know how big the the, uh, the ray dome is across, probably 25 feet or something, and that's a pretty small target to hit with yeah. a five-inch gun. So they, right. ended up, they ended up running into it and oh. breaking it open okay. and sinking it. But wow. that's, uh, it was quite an experience. That's why I, when I, I when I got off active duty, uh, actually uh, uh, when I came back on the Ranger. Uh, my wife was raised by her grandparents, and because uh, her grandmother, her mother died when she was born, and uh, her grandfather was very sick and, and dying. So we decided to stay on active duty was one thing, or come back. And so we decided to come back. I could have gone either way, and no, not sorry I came back, because I know a lot of people that uh, made a career. I was talking to an admiral up in uh, at Miami one time, and we recognized each other, although we didn't remember where we rec met each other. And I told him why I came back, and he gave me an interesting comment. He said, yeah, I know what you mean. I came home from an eight-month cruise. I walked in the house and said, honey, I'm home. And she said, that's nice. We're going on vacation. I didn't ask him if he was still married. but. You know, not being on active duty, I got a chance to see my kids grow up and be with them and so on. So I, I think I made the right choice. Mm -hmm. And I, as I said, I stayed in the reserves until uh, 1986. And I was commanding officer of two different units down at the reserve center down in Cincinnati. How often do you ha were you employed uh, while you're in the reserves, actually doing military function. The only time we ever actually went on, on active duty for training, they called it, was two weeks a year. And to be perfectly frank, I mean, I can't get fired for just saying it, but right. it was a waste of time, most of the time. Uh, you went to a ship, and I went to the Forestall, and to an APA, and to an LSD, and uh, an LST about eight or nine different ships during the time. I went to school too, uh, guided missile school, <coughs> tactical warfare school, and those schools, and they were worthwhile, the schools. But when you went bo on board a ship, uh, a lot of times the ships didn't know you were coming until you got there. They didn't have a program for you. You would have to attach yourself to a, uh, an officer and follow him around and learn what you could. But it could have been a lot better spent doing something else. Uh, were you uh, subject to recall to active duty though during the Vietnam conflict? Oh yes, but they didn't recall us. They never recalled a reservist during Vietnam. Is that right? Not until the Gulf War started. I got out, as I said, retired in 86, although my retirement certificate doesn't say that. Yeah. But, uh, uh, but they didn't recall anybody. Evidently, they had enough people. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, now, if I would have stayed on active duty, I would probably go on to destroyer school and then been on a destroyer someplace, possibly, well, I'm sure, in, over in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. um, you say you got into uh, Hong Kong. Tell F us a little bit about that. Fantastic it. place. Uh, all the taxi cabs are Mercedes, but uh, uh, it's it's a fantastic place. Uh, you know, everybody that goes to Hong Kong, the first thing you do is you go buy a suit, and three days later you pick it up, a tailor-made suit for thirty dollars. Uh, you know, you can spend yourself broke there. Uh, or a pair of alligator shoes. Oh, well, I didn't get alligator shoes, but I bought tailor-made shoes to so put your foot on a piece right. of paper. They draw a picture of your foot and. We were uh, we stopped in uh, Hong Kong Did you? also, but I had a pair of alligator shoes made. You know. Did you really? I mean, well, you could get them made, and um, and this interview is not about me, but they could only mail one shoe home at a time. Oh, is that right? Yeah, because there was restrictions on that skin at that time. I see. And uh, 
so you had to give them your address and then wait a couple of weeks when you got home. But get uh, your other shoe. Yeah, but the suits are unbelievable. And paintings too. The, the we, uh, you know, Hong Kong was fine. We anchored out. We had to take uh, a junk or the Star Ferry. Well, the Star Ferry to get from Kowloon, which is the mainland part, to right. the island. But uh, uh, take a junk from the ship to the to the uh, island, and uh, it was it was interesting because at that time we the. Three of the times we went into Hong Kong, one time, the first time we went in there, it was a big to-do because Queen Elizabeth's sister, was her, I think her sister, was going to, there. And so everything was celebration. Margaret. Our Margaret or Anne or something, yeah. sister or niece or so, whoever it was, anyhow. Uh, and it was all decked out and so on. And you still see, the second time was during a cholera, epi cholera epidemic. And of course, we all had our cholera shots, so we were just told don't drink water, so we didn't drink water, we drank beer. But uh, uh, we uh, went there. The third time was between October 1st and October 10th. Now, we, we went in on the second. The first is the Chinese Communist holiday, October 1st. And we didn't want to be there then. So the 10th was the 10th day of the 10th month, which is a big Chinese holiday. And we didn't want to be there then, so we went in the second and left the ninth. But uh, uh, that was like Chinese New Year, and there was, you, we anchored out in the bay there, and you could hear, it sounded like a war going on on the island, because firecrackers going off all over the place. Uh, they, people just get packages of fireworks, light them, and throw them up in the air. And uh, you're lucky nobody got hurt, but uh, but we were in there, and, and of course every day we we'd go to a bunch of restaurants. There's some very good restaurants in Cho Hong Kong that I, and tour the island, go all the way around the island. We went up to the Chinese border once, and uh, uh, really got to see a lot of Hong Kong. That was fun, the yeah. floating village and all of that. Mm -hmm. But uh, and like I say. We didn't make a lot of money. Only made two hundred dollars a month, mm -hmm. but uh, as an ensign. But we uh, spent it all when we got to Hong Kong on suits, and yeah. I think I got three suits and a bunch of shirts. Yeah, and everything else. Um, anything else you want to tell us about um, your active duty status before we go into the rest of your life? Uh, not, uh, nothing I can think of anyway. Um, we, so, you get discharged from active duty when? Uh, released from active duty in, uh, I forget what it was, June something, 1962. Came to Cincinnati, uh, joined the reserves the first thing I got here. Well, how did, how did you and your wife end up in Cincinnati? Well, she was from Cincinnati and her husband, her, her husband, uh, her grandfather was was sick in the hospital. And what was uh, his name? You recall? His name was uh, Robert Kelly. Who? Robert J. Kelly. Uh huh. And he was in the hospital, and not a, I guess he was. I don't know if he was expected to live or not, but he was very sick. And he was 83, and uh, so we came back to Cincinnati, and I decided to look for a job in Cincinnati or Cleveland and uh, ended up finding one in Cincinnati, so. Where at? Uh, at Kroger Company. Mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, and um, you said your wife's name was Moo? Mary Moomaw. Moomaw, what, uh, what nationality is Moomaw? I think Scottish or British or something like that. Uh -huh. So that, that area, I believe. I do genealogy. She'd, yeah. she'd probably tell me I should know, but. Yeah. I do genealogy for Sons of the American Revolution, as you know, and I'm always interested in serving. I did find out that I'm eligible for that. Well, good. On my mother's side, there were, I can't remember, my daughter's doing a little bit, and they found well, out that there was somebody, two people, one of them died in a British prison during the, here during the Reserv Revolution, and the other one died at Concord, I believe. Well. We'll, we'll talk about that after the interview because yeah, I'll yeah. get you to join our group. Um, 
So you and Mary ended up in Cincinnati because of her grandfather. Yes. And uh, where did you live at then? Lived, uh, well, we, we got, uh, she lived in Kennedy Heights and uh, we got a, a, an apartment building in, in uh, Westwood, right? That's really Chevy, but it's in the city part. What's, what street? Carmel Terrace. Carmel Terrace. It's right off Hamel, or uh, the main drag right Harrison, goes, Harrison Avenue, Avenue mm -hmm. goes right through Chevy at by I forget the name of the funeral home yeah. right yeah. there you turn um, off it yeah because we uh, in the same period of time when I got out of the service we lived on Brackenwoods Lane in 1961 oh, okay, okay. Yeah, you know where that's at I'm familiar with Brackenwoods Lane yeah nice place to live in 1960 right one so you went to work at Kroger's. Went to work at Kroger's. What with, were you doing for uh, Kroger's? I be, was store manager training. Yeah. I was a store manager for uh, a while, assistant for two or three years, and then got was a store manager at a store in White Oak, and then one in. Uh, then I went in as assistant grocery buyer, and that's where I really wanted to be. And they needed a store manager, so they moved me back to a store in my, in Norwood. And I decided I didn't want all the work on Friday nights and Saturdays, and they were op opening on Sundays and so on. So How long did you stay with Kroger? Total, well, in the stores for 10 years, and then I, I quit. And they asked me what I wanted to do, and I said, well, I wanted to get in accounting. And they said, well, we'll see what we got. And they had accounting, and I stayed at the, was an accountant at the meat plant, meat we're breaking plant, which is out at Tri-County. It's now Smithfield mm -hmm. uh, yeah. for seven years, and then it was getting ready to close, and I left and uh, went to work for Hillshire Farm and Cons, the county. So you were actually with Kroger's for 17 seven, years. 17 years. And then I left there, and. And then I, Hillshire. Hillshire, and uh, among the different names, Cons, right. Sara Lee. Down on uh, Spring Hillshire. Grove Avenue? Well, I was in Spring Grove Avenue for seven years. And then uh, we opened the plant over in, they call it Claryville, Kentucky, south of Alexandria, where mm -hmm. they make all the hot dogs and so on. And I went over there as plant controller for, and I was there 10 years till I retired. So you were an accountant for Kroger's at the end there for seven years. And then did you start as a, an accountant with uh, Cons for 20 years total. For 20 years. So I started off in accounting, you know, as so a freshman switched to marketing, never used my marketing, uh, unless you count store manager at Kroger, but, but then I ended up working uh, 27 years in accounting. I see. So. Yeah. So, um, so you actually retired from cons then after how many years again? 20. 20, and what year was that? 2000. The year 2000, I see. But, uh, and where were you and Mary living all this time while you were working in Kentucky, so to what, College Hill. And your address? It was, it was on Harbison Avenue, 1631. And, and uh, it was 27 miles one way to work and back, but uh, that was okay. Yeah. Um, what church did you guys belong to while you lived there? College Hill Presbyterian Church. And uh, Still do. Uh -huh. You... Uh, um, Mentioned that you're part of a cop organization. What is cop? Uh, Citizens on Patrol. Uh, years ago, and I think it was 1997, uh, San Diego and someplace in Texas had this program where they had uh, individual citizens out walking the duty uh, beat as eyes and ears for the police. At that time, we had. Uh, a lot of drug dealers and so on in College Hill, standing on the corner, had their own territories and so on. And in 2000, the, I was president of the local community council, and the District 5 captain came to me and said, hey, I'd like to organize one here in College Hill. Would you be interested? And I said, yes. And we've done that and they're continuing to do that today. Uh, obviously, uh, crime has come way down uh, I was told last month that uh, the ones that still have the citizens on patrol groups, 
patrolling that uh, crime is a lot lower in those communities than it is any place else. We ride uh, a day a week and try to ride more if we can and we walk for two or three hours three times a week. Now when you ride, do you ride in your own car? No, we ride in a, a car that says Citizens on Patrol on the side. It's not very good for sneaking up on places, but uh, but it but people see us and it's more. Uh, now well, they're aware that you're surveilling them. If they're doing something illegal, you report them. Right, absolutely. We've we've had lots and lots over the period of time. We had uh, uh, obviously as the crime's gone down, there have been fewer. But uh, in 2009, uh, we were out and a police call said that uh, they had a. Uh, three guys on the back deck of a house and I figured well when they leave the deck they're going this way so I went on the next street where I thought they were going to go we ended up we didn't catch them but we corralled them so to speak because we're not allowed to catch we're, we if something happens we're supposed to go the other direction so uh, and we do but uh, uh, we stayed there and saw them they got caught and they had been responsible for 15 burglaries and uh, we had another situation where uh, a stash house they reported they got 75 pounds of marijuana. We've had probably about, we've been doing it, we're in our 19th year, and I guess one good one a year, totally. Not so many. We had one fellow that, uh, uh, that the police were looking for. We saw him. We stayed on the radio until the police, we knew he was going to run. Then finally he ran and he ended up sh shooting at a cop, but they got him and he's still in jail. But that was uh, 2009 too. Two years ago I was just told, I was talking to a cop the other night and I said, you know, has there any, been, been anything that, that we've done recently? He said, well, he said in 2016 you reported a house where you thought there were drugs being dealt out of and we got on it and they arrested somebody and through that arrest they arrested somebody else that was wanted in a homicide someplace else so we've done a lot of good things uh just being a presence though is the, yeah. the, the main thing and it works you know um i'd, I'd like to uh, show a couple of pictures that we have of you and just tell us what they are if you will okay please. well let's take this one first all right this picture is, what's that represent? That's, uh, that's me in a flight suit at Pensacola. My senior year, that's where I spent spring break, my senior year in a T-34, by a T-34. That's when I wanted to be a, a pilot and somebody decided that my eyes weren't good enough. So mm -hmm. I didn't get to be a pilot, but I had hair then. Yeah. You were and looked a little looked a little younger. Yes, uh, and I'm going to hold these pictures so he can zoom okay. in on. What does this picture here represent? That's a picture. Back in those days, you always had to get a picture when you got promoted. And when I was an ensign, and then went to lieutenant junior grade in '61, that was my official Navy picture. Uh huh. Outstanding. And uh, let's we skip that one till the end. Yeah. Till the end. Yeah. Um, and this picture here showing uh, Commander Farrington and uh, Admiral Admiral Redding. Conley. Yeah. This was taken. Uh, this was the second year because now, now I know where w the thing with the Ticonderoga. Because what this, ship is this? This is the USS Ticonderoga, CV fourteen or CVA fourteen. Uh, Admiral Conley was my boss. The Captain, Captain Farrington was the CO of the Ticonderoga, and and we were on uh, that ship for for a while. Mm -hmm. And this picture here, this uh, is the 36. That's the Antietam. That's the uh, uh, actually not the first ship I was on. The first ship I was on was on a summer cruise. I was on a cruiser, the USS Bremerton, CA 130. But this was the spring when I was in Pensacola, we got a chance to go out on the Antietam, which is the first aircraft carrier that had the angled deck put on it. Okay, Antietam. And, um, and, and, that, and this picture here of... 
That's the Ranger. Ah. Yep. That's the USS Ranger, the, the what newest ship. CV what? CV 30, 61. 61. 61. And I think we shaved with that one because it's been scrapped. Oh, it is? Oh, yeah. yeah. Every ship I was on except been scrapped except the Oriskany and they sunk it for a reef. Now, the, tell us where the Oriskany is now. It's a reef off the coast, I forget how far, off 20 miles or something off the coast of Pensacola. Mm -hmm. And it's amazing because I've run into, over a period of the last two or three years, three different people that said, either I dove on that ship last year or I'm going to this year. Uh -huh. So, it's fun. And this picture here, um, of a group of officers? That's that's the group of midshipmen when we were on the Antietam. To get to that we had to go out, it was at sea and or off the coast, not the middle of the ocean someplace, but uh, several miles off. We had to go out in a small boat and they lowered the elevator down, put a rope ladder down and we had to climb the rope ladder which is not easy, not fun. Right. But you can do it. Um, and this last picture here of oh the of you and Mary and and uh, that's uh, my two kids that and the governor of Ohio and Strickland on the far side over there uh, that was when I was inducted in 2010 and inducted into the Ohio Veterans Hall of Fame ah well good congratulations on that thank you um, and I would like to show a couple of these uh, plaques yeah. and pictures that we have here. Um, this is in, uh, to Commander James Bodmer, June of 5th of 1960 to July the 1st, 1986. In sincere appreciation of your dedicated service to the U.S. Navy, officers and crew. A beautiful plaque. And which one of these would you like to highlight, uh, Well, Jim? that's uh, just a letter of commendation that I got someplace. There's, uh, mm -hmm. that's not as good. There's, this one happens to be the commission as an ensign that I got in 1960. And uh, then you get one every time. You don't get one as a JG, but you get one as a lieutenant and a lieutenant commander, which are not as fancy as that. Mm -hmm. And then when I retired as a commander, they give you one as your last command. Is that the one that has an error in it? Or? No, the, oh. this, the next one is the one that has the error. This is a certificate of retirement. And it says on there, from the Armed Forces of the United States to all those presents, greetings, and so on, and it says, having served faithfully and honorably, was retired from the United States Navy on the 3rd of June, 1998. That was the day I turned 60 years old. So according to the government, they call it the Defense Enrollment something system, the DEER system, they had me on active duty from the day I got my commission till the day I turned 60 years old. Which is not true. <laughs> Which is not true. I retired in 86. But I asked them where my money was and they laughed. <laughs> yeah. Uh, this is uh, this from Miami University. Yeah, this is uh, Miami University every year has what they call the Sidney Sowers Award. And Sidney Sowers was a, a Miami graduate uh, in World War II. He was, Truman appointed him as, a, I think, an admiral. And uh, he ended up being the first... Uh, uh, head of the CIA, but Miami has a, an outstanding or distinguished alumni award that they give every year, and I happen to be a recipient in 2006. You know, you're mentioning Miami University. I just wanted to give you a little uh, tidbit. Uh, my name is Raymond Hughes, and uh, as I understand it, the first president of Miami University was Raymond M. Hughes. Well, I don't think he was the first, but he was one of the first, anyhow. I uh, think Robert Hamilton Bishop was the first, but he was, there's a Hughes Hall up there. Yeah, and uh, we're trying to prove that link, but we've well, not been to. successful so far, though, because yeah, the Hughes it. name turns out to be one of the most common names there are. Is it? And this is something I know you're very proud of, and uh, this is uh, the plaque uh, representing uh, Jim's induction into the Ohio Veterans Hall of Fame. 
and uh, this uh, was dated um, 2010 something. 2010 yeah and they give you a medal too yes ah yes did you get a medal yes I did yeah um, and uh, that's a wonderful it's wonderful a, acknowledgement of your it's of, a, of, an honor and it's, yeah. it's it's more for what you do after your active duty rather than uh, what you did on active duty yeah. and and, uh, and I've been involved in the community for you joined you joined some time. wonderful people in that uh, organization well Tom, Tom Griffin well of course Ted Gardner, Ken Glass and Ted Ken Gardner Glass. and and George Custer now I'm not quite sure how George Custer got in because I didn't know he did anything after active duty <laughs> but uh, I've always tried to figure that out. But uh, but he's uh, a member. Bob Feller's a member. Oh uh, yeah, sure. Clark Gable. Uh, I forget who's yeah, all. Clark was from list. Ohio. Most people don't right. know that. Up, right. Little village up here. Um, well, that's um, it's been a wonderful interview. Um, at this point in the interviews, I, I, I certainly ask Brian if he has any questions he would like to ask. Uh, I was wondering why did you go with the Navy? Why not a different armed forces? There is no other armed force. Uh, no, actually, when I was a kid, you know, growing up, and I remember everything as a little kid during World War II. I was six when it ended, when Germany surrendered, and seven when Japan surrendered. And I remember where I was both days. And I remember the blackouts and the Air Raid Wardens. My father was too old for World War II and too young for World War I, so he didn't serve. But he was in charge of a bunch of Air Raid Wardens groups, and, and, uh, and I remember all that. And I remember a lot of people, I didn't know anybody that got killed in World War II. So, you know, if they went to war, I was too little and they got killed. But I knew people that came back from World War II. And it, they just were heroes to me. And, and uh, and I said, well, I always wanted to be in the service. And we always played war and run through the ravines and so on as a little kid, as opposed to cowboys and Indians. And, uh, and I said, uh, gee, maybe I want to be in the service sometime. And when I went to Miami, and I don't want to uh, offend uh, Ray, because they had Navy ROTC and Air Force ROTC. Come on. And uh, I'm only kidding. <laughs> and anyhow, so I said, oh, Navy sounds, I, I like the Navy. I like chips and so on. So, so I, I joined the Navy ROTC. And the ROTC, Air Force ROTC back then, gee, it was about three times the size of the Navy ROTC. But most of them just went two years and quit. The Navy ROTC, for some reason, we didn't have anybody that quit after two years. We all stayed either flunked the or The Air stayed. Force was probably tougher. Probably tougher. <laughs> they, all watched, they all watched Victory at Sea movie, or Air Force movie. movie. <laughs> the first two years they did, the first year that's all they did. Uh, How did you decide to go into ROTC? How did you... Well, you I was interested. I saw, a t a, I saw a table up there where they had said, you know, I didn't know anything about the ROTC program ahead of time, so I didn't become a, a scholarship program through the ROTC. But I saw a table that said, sign a ROTC title on it, and I said, gee, that sounds interesting, so I went over and signed up and loved it. So even though we had the Marine Corps drill sergeant marching us and so on. So. I was going to ask, what were some of the things that you would do in ROTC? Well, mostly classes, uh, uh, whether they went from uh, naval history to uh, learning navigation and, <coughs> and all that. But, uh, uh, but the only thing, and we had drill once a week or twice a week, whatever, and uh, did some marching. And it was, it was fun. I, just the thing to do, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, did anybody else in your family get into the military? Did your brother? Or my brother. Your my brother went to Miami for two years, and he left. He was. Uh, he went into the army for, on the. Reserve joined the army. I don't know if it was army or army national guard, whichever it was. But. Uh, so he was in the army, and he was down someplace down in New Mexico, and I know it was near 
San Antonio for a while or something. But uh, he was never in it for a long period of time. So you, when you got out, you, you got into accounting. Was that something you learned while you were in the... In the no, I wanted to be an accountant. And when I went to college, I wanted to get into accounting. And, and uh, actually, I made a mistake. I, I tried to memorize it rather than learn it. I, I blame that on my high school class because we had a very s smart high school class. And so we didn't have to take exams because we were so, supposed to be so smart. It did not prepare us for college, in my estimation. And uh, so when, when I was in accounting, and I was struggling. I said, gee, I'm going to be a naval officer the rest of my life anyhow. Why do I want to bother with accounting? I'll get into something easier, okay? And so I changed to marketing. And, but when I had the opportunity to make that decision, I always seemed to want to be in, a, in accounting. So I just went and I learned as I went along. I, just picked it up, went in and did the job. And did, when you were actually got in the Navy and you're like on your first boat and you're going out, did you have any Ship? problems? Yeah, were you, were you having any problems with uh, seasickness? Or no, anything? no. I, uh, we had one fellow happen to be a chaplain on the Oriskany that got seasick. But a, it's, a aircraft carrier almost rocks you to sleep. I mean, it's, it's so smooth. Uh, it squeaks a lot because the aircraft carriers, the Oriskany and Ticonderoga were built in three sections and they all move independently of each other a little bit. The Ranger wasn't either. I'd been seasick. I was on a destroyer escort for two weeks and was seasick for three days, first three days. I was on a destroyer off of uh, Key West and I didn't get sick, but I almost got sick. Uh, no sin to get sick seasick it's uh, it just happens when you when you when you go ship goes one way and your stomach goes another way and the rest of you goes a third way you know it's pretty easy uh, did you when you're on the aircraft carriers did you ever uh, have much encounters with the, with the roof rats I don't know if they, they were called back down with the guys on the top deck uh, the guys on the main deck yeah. uh, not really uh, you know, we'd get out on the main deck if they weren't going to have anything and run, uh, just for exercise. But uh, not really. The, the, and that's a dangerous job, uh, certainly. Were there close calls? Are you, you having calls of anything? Well, not for me. We, as I said, we had. There were accidents. Uh, uh, wasn't our aircraft carrier one we were administratively in charge of, the Coral Sea had a, a, a resting gear cable break and uh, and like I say we had we had airplanes go over the side or uh, they usually didn't run into the fan tail of the ship, the back of it, but they miss the... When a, when a plane lands, first thing it does as soon as it hits the deck it throws on full power and that's so if the cable, I've seen the cable bounce or the uh, resting gear tail hook bounce over all four wires and so you got to have enough power to get back in the air if you do that so if it doesn't that's when they run into problems and don't make it up in the air what, what kind of aircraft was taken off on some of the air, air uh, the, the well mostly uh, small a4 we had a4s which are a4 skyhawk we had, uh, which is a small fighter plane, we launched in Manila Bay. We were in there once and, and I forget, it was the uh, Argentinian cruiser that they sunk off the Falklands. It was there at the same time and we weren't on real friendly terms with them, I guess. So we decided that while we were in anchor, we'd launch a plane. So we did launch an A-4, which you, you can do from, from anchor. Usually you try to get going into the wind at, 30 knots, so you get 30 knots of airspeed off your, over your bow, and then, then the, what the plane furnishes the rest. But we had those. We had the 80 Sky Raider, or the AC, yeah, 80 Sky Raider, which was uh, the prop plane. We had the F3H Demon, the F4 
or FAU Corsair, or uh, yeah, Cor. F four U. F four U is the. F four U F six wasn't it? F four. F well, that was F four. We didn't have any of them. Those are all uh, the F eight U Crusader. That's what I'm trying to say. Oh, okay. Uh, there is a Corsair afterward that looks like the Crusader. Right. But uh, uh, and then we had the big A three D Sky Raider. Sky. I think it was Sky something. I forget now. It's been fifty some years, but that was the plane that that was so wide. It was like the size of a medium bomber, and uh, that would land and take off. And it was fun to go watch them. Uh, wish you were in them sometimes, but. Uh, Did they have to do any landings at night? Did they do oh yes. Do oh yes. And, and even when you're landing, you know, the ship is going like this. And, and when they come down, uh, they really try to get over the top of the ship. I, I, I'm not a pilot, so I couldn't say for sure, but the two times I was on and did land, and that was in a prop plane, which was pretty easy. But I think they try to get above the ship, and then they just cut the power. And, and it's, a, like I said, a controlled crash. And you hit the deck and throw your power on so that you can get off if you have to. But it's at night and you got just the, the lights of the ship, the blue lights that you, all you can see and it's just like it shows in the movies. So this is all kind of during the Cold War era. Did you guys Pretty run much. much Soviet uh, vessels out there? Well, yeah, we... Uh, the only time we ever had a problem was when uh, uh, we'd get close going over up to northern part of Japan. And uh, we were in the line with, uh, actually, I was on watch. Uh, in, in addition to communications, I was uh, assistant staff tactical watch officer when I stood watches on the flag bridge. And uh, in fact, I had just walked off the flag bridge of the Ticonderoga when the destroyer hit us, but uh, which was quarter after 12 at night, which is when most accidents happen. But uh, there was a radar contact coming down from Kamchatka, and uh, I was standing watching, we were watching it on the radar, and uh, ended up, I called up to the CO, uh, the CO's bridge was one level above the flag bridge the flags the Admiral's Bridge. And I said, uh, Sound General Quarters, there's a contact approaching us. Well, it turned out that it was Pan American Airways. And it was the same flight, if you remember back, I don't know how many years ago, the flight that came over there that got shot down. Yes. It was that, that same flight that came down there. But uh, the, you know, the Admiral ran up to the bridge and everybody sounded General Quarters. We were at General Quarters. and All the Admiral said to me was, Good job, you can't take a chance. So uh, that was the only, I think it might have been a contact. It was eerie kind of walking across the junks in Hong Kong because they had communist, Chinese communist flags flying on them. And, and when I said about the time when we were there between uh, October 1st and October 10th, there were, there were more communist flags flying in Hong Kong than you could imagine. It was just, uh, even though it belonged to the British. But it was kind of an interesting time. Mm -hmm. Well, you were, uh, while you were in the Navy, you were over there, and, and uh, you know, I knew you were off the coast of Vietnam and stuff, but and I was just kind of curious, what was your, uh, what did Vietnam come onto your radar being in the military? What did you, I mean, obviously when you first joined that room, nobody was really talking about Vietnam. Do you remember a time when that? Well, we were talking about it when we, when we, when we went over there. Because, uh, like I say, they were fighting in Laos, and you know how soon would it be in Vietnam, and and that's what they were trying to to stop. Uh, to my recollection, there were three brothers that were kind of fighting for power in in Vietnam, and one of them, if I remember the names, one was Savannah Fuma, Fumi No Savan and Savannah Vong. Savannah Vong was the pro-communist guy, and we didn't like him. Uh, Fumi Nosavan was the guy that was kind of middle road. 
and Savannah Fumi was the guy that was pro-US and we backed him. Now I know a lot of people say that you know if we would continued the war for a little bit longer we the communists were ready to give up and I've heard people that, that were fighting for the communists over there say the same thing but I think that if we just the the middle guy Savannah Fuma was kind of the middle of the road guy but he was the guy that people liked and I think if we'd have probably backed him my opinion if we'd have backed him maybe it would have been a different but we were talking about that when we were over there because part of being on the staff we got a lot of intelligence we got a lot of stuff that uh, can't talk about but uh, you know we had another mission too on when we were over there that that I'm not allowed to talk about so well, I just got one last question I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about uh, your day when you got into the Hall of Fame what was that like what, what what's the What's that day like? What are they? What are they? Uh, well, can you take us through through that day a little bit? We went up. Uh, I, I, Ken Glass, a friend of ours that's passed away now, he nominated me back for the Hall of Fame in 2006. I guess it was. Two, I think it was 2006. And uh, or 2010. 2010. Yeah. And uh, uh, we went up to Columbus, and they had I forget where it was exactly in a building they had a kind of like a parade in cars and that was not so much but then we went into the to the uh, auditorium and <coughs> and the governor was there and he uh, before we got inducted we were all sitting kind of behind stage and uh, he said, well, I was at a, a breakfast this morning with Colin Powell, and I told him I had to leave to come over here, and he said, I want to come over too. I want to meet those guys. So we had the opportunity to meet Colin Powell. And, uh, you know, it's nice to meet you, sir, and so on. He said, no, it's, it was the other way around. He, wa he wanted to shake our hands. So uh, different, but that was different. And then we, of course, got on stage, and you probably had the same thing where we were sitting on stage and then then each one of us and I don't know what was on the screen behind me because I wasn't looking at it but they had some pictures that I had uh, sent to them a couple of those pictures and and uh, uh, some other uh, stuff on the screen what our history was and then you read the the biography and put the medal around our neck and gave us the plaque and then they had a dinner and that was it. It was exciting. It was quite an honor, I would say. Yeah. Uh, Where is the Hall of Fame in Columbus? It's, okay. it's directly across the street from the Capitol in the uh, Vern Reif building. Uh, I guess it's, it's Vern Reif. It's Reif anyhow. I think it is Vern Reif. Anyhow, it's right across the street from the Capitol building. And you go in and go around and it's a big area they got set aside on the wall with all the plaques. and. Uh, and, and not plaques like this, but it's just a bronze plaque with 20 names on it, each mm -hmm. glass or 19. Great. Thanks. Sure. Thank you. So, is that all, Brian? Yeah. yeah. Well, we've, um, we've reached the end of our interview, and I want to, uh, Jim, I want to thank you for oh, thank the you. interview, and I also want to take this time to thank you for the service to our country and also for the service to our communities. Well, thank you too. Thank you. You're very welcome.